the missing presentation. If you were go to, uh, to go to the website of the American Geophysical Union, you can find that there was a meeting in 2012, a joint meeting of the American Geophysical Union and the Asia Oceania, Oceania Geophysical Society. It was held on the 11th through the 15th of August of 2012 in Singapore. Uh, that's convenient for the Asia Oceania Geophysical Society. It's also convenient for the American Geophysical Union. It means you can visit Singapore on uh, your university's dime. Um, and uh, there's, the, uh, there's the program, or the website for the program. And if you go there, you'll find something like this, scientific programs schedule at a glance. And if you look down here, you will see that uh, LEO2 comes down to day three Wednesday. Let's move down there. And you get um, BGO2. And when you click on that, you will find this popping up. Um, main conveners, Dr. Jenyin Kim and uh, session chairs Zheng Yin Kim and Carme, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, Hugue, I assume it's French. And uh, you'll notice that Hugue was the, uh, the first titled speaker, environmental drivers, and then we have two reconstruction by somebody named Su Jun, and you have somebody named uh, Bing Lang, and then you have uh, Jung Hyun Kim presenting number four, and then you have fifth. Whoops, uh, wait a minute. Where's five? Um, well, let's see. Six is Professor Selvaraj Kandasamy from China. Hmm, well, let's look at another spot maybe, and this is HTP www.hoceania. Anyway. Uh, and this is, allows you to look at the abstract. So let's, um, and it says all abstracts of session BG02. Maybe we'll find it here. And this is actually a very long thing, so I've split it into two so that it fits on the screen. As you'll notice that uh, application of paleolimnology, paleo, oceanography, and paleoclimate. Um, and the first one, I come a, you get, okay, you gay, we, we found that one. Let's scroll down and here you have three, um, carbon caption and storage and rocks, okay. Four, uh, tracing soil carbon, Junyun Kim. Six, carbon isotopic. Uh, what's going on, they, can't they count? Um, well, maybe if we look at the schedule before the meeting, we can find out. See, you, it's the same, you know, four and six that we had before. Um, so we'll go to a, um, a screenshot that was captured before the meeting. And now we have O3 carbon caption in storage. O4 tracing soil organic carbon in the lower Jungian Kim. Well, now we have an O5. A comparison of delta 13 and PMC values for 10 Cretaceous Jurassic dinosaur bones from Texas to Alaska, USA, China, and Europe. By Hugh Miller, Hugh Owen. Uh, let's uh, move on over that. Oh, by the way, you'll notice that there are times 1630, 1645, 1700 had. 15 minutes there for this paper. Um, and here you can see Mesia Jircic. Those of you who have watched the movie Expelled may remember he's the Polish guy that uh, talked to um, uh, talked to uh, Ben uh, Stein about how Poland is a little more open than the United States for this kind of thing. Hmm. Um, 
And then we have 06, which is uh, Selvaraj, Kandasami, and so forth. Well, maybe they just didn't get an abstract in. Well, actually, it turns out they did have an abstract, and unfortunately, I don't have a shot of that, but uh, I'll give you the abstract they did give. Uh, BG012, A012, a comparison of Delta 13 and PMC values for 10 Cretaceous Jurassic dinosaur bones from Texas to Alaska, USA, China, and Europe. And uh, this is the actual spelling that somehow got into what, uh, what's available. Um, by Hugh Miller, Hugh Owen, Robert Bennett, yep, same guys. Um, and um, uh, some from the paleo group from the United States, some from France, some from Poland. And uh, the corresponding author is uh, Hugo Ciel. Okay. And uh, continuing on with the abstract itself, presented here are the results of studies comparing delta-13 carbon. That's the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13, which goes, the 13 goes down in plants, and particularly in plants that use the C3 method because they are more selective and they prefer carbon-12 to carbon-13, and they prefer it twice as much to carbon-14. And uh, so that's what the delta-13C is. And the percent modern carbon for various bone fractions, such as residual collagen in situ calcium carbonate, that's in bioappetite, et cetera, from eight dinosaurs from Texas to Arkansas, uh, or Alaska. That, that's Alaska. Uh, and one from China. Uh, the accelerated mass spectrometer was used for 20 of 22 samples, primarily at the University of Georgia, with sensitivity of greater than 50,000 radiocarbon years. All samples were pre-treated to remove contaminants. The two large samples were tested on conventional equipment as another cross-check. In other words, they did it both AMS and this old-fashioned way. Um, the delta-13 carbon range was minus 20.1. That's in parts per thousand. Um, so it's about 2% less than you would expect um, for collagen in about 0.3%, or uh, 3 per thousand if you like, for calcium carbonate with the percent modern carbon range of 6.45 to 0.76, which translates to apparent ages of 22,020 plus or minus 50 for calcium carbonate in a Psittacosaurus from the Gobi de Desert to about 39,000 plus or minus 140 for calcium carbonate. Now, if you're wondering how you do that, it's a very simple uh, formula. And if you don't remember it, you can look at the video later and get the, but it's a pretty standard formula. Percent modern carbon is equal to 100% times two to the minus age over the half-life. Or if you like, a e to the age over the mean life does the same analysis. And again, the age can be done uh, by basically reversing that procedure. Um, and those of you who are wondering why are they using 5568 is because everybody used to use 5568, so they're not going to change in the middle of the stream because then you don't know which articles are using which uh, half-life. So you just everybody uses the old one even though they know it's inaccurate. It's really 5,730 years, plus or minus 40. The delta C uh, 13 range, let's see, so that's how they got those, those ages. Um, in a triceratops from Montana, included in the study were an Allosaurus, a can Acrocanthosaurus, a Patasaurus, two triceratops, and three Hadrosaurs. Documentation will include dinosaur verifications, geological formations, delta 13 uh, percent modern carbon, which is, of course, a carbon convertible directly using that formula into a carbon-14 age, and carbon-14 methodologies, and laboratories, the laboratories that actually did this. So, when two grams of a Belgian Mosasaur were pre-treated to remove contaminants, the percent modern carbon was 4.68, 4.68% of the modern carbon. 
or 24,600 radiocarbon years. Lindgren et al., 2011 plus one. That's right, they got that published. This Mosasaur age was also concordant with percent modern carbons for dinosaurs from Texas to Alaska and China, uh, but there were, in that particular data, there was no delta-13 carbon. Delta-13 carbon values in this study were similar to dinosaur delta-13 carbon values from the Judith River Formation in Alberta, Canada, that also reported delta-15 uh, nitrogen, but they didn't test for carbon-14. And there's a reference, uh, radiocarbon methods are valuable in geochronology, and uh, they cite the, uh, the Lake Sugietsu in Japan. Sediment deposits as function of particle size and density, not time in moving waters. Uh, so this helps explain percent modern carbons in dinosaur bones. And again, they have a, uh, a reference behind that. Primary areas for fo further fossil studies will be Alberta, Canada, Gobi Desert, and Xinjiang, China. Hmm. Well, so they're finding carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. Well, maybe they put in the abstract, but they just never showed up. Well, actually, the presentation is on YouTube. And um, you're going to get to watch it. It's only 15 minutes long. Let's see if I can pull that up for you real quick. such very unusual C14 dating experiments on dinosaur bones and um, present the excavation sites and specimens, how the samples were pre-treated, and then I present this new results which will be, uh, will be very uh, interesting to all of you and finally discuss them, their origin, and arrive at the conclusion and suggestion for further work. For what it's worth, the uh, presenter is uh, Thomas Seiler. He's a uh, German. It's doing pretty good for English, I'd say. C14 has been reported from Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Carbonaceous earth material, and original biochemistry, soft tissue, has been reported in fossils, including dinosaurs. This is the work of Mary Schweitzer et al. and I will show you. And we also have a, a report of Jurassic Squid Inc., which was verified as original eumelanin. Hemoglobin remnants have been observed in the Tyrannosaurus rex and in the Mosasaur. Collagen and Festocalcine have been reported from a Jurassic Archaeopteryx. Now, what is the reason for these unexpected results? This was our basic, one of our basic motivations for following uh, these uh, C14 experiments. This gives you an impression of a Triceratops and Heterosaur deposit in Glendive, Montana, Badlands, where we performed excavations. And this is a specimen of a, a Triceratops femur bone deposited on sand and clay. And this shows how such a bone is sawed into two pieces in order to extract samples from different points here. Uh, this gives you a view on the interior of such a bone and you see remarkably well-preserved fine structures and here is the interior for heterosaur bone which shows Habersian canals. We saw the tunnels for the blood vessels. And uh, this was the sample pre-treatment which we applied, which the laboratories applied to which we have sent our samples. It's the standard procedure for carbon extraction and cleaning. Uh, it will be familiar to several of you. Uh, it's the uh, fossil bone will be crushed. We can have samples up to 500 milligram in mass. And then um, it's the CO2 evolves under vacuum and acetic acid uh, treatment is given. It removes the superficial calcium carbonate, which is 
one potential source of contamination. And the next step is that uh, sodium hydroxide is applied in order to remove organic contaminants. And then we can apply strong hydrochloric acid in order to, re to sample the bone appetite, calcium carbonate in the bone appetite, which will evolve as CO2, or part of it as CO2, and these CO2 molecules are used for dating with C14. The remaining organics, collagen, this fraction, if it's a sufficient amount, will then further be uh, processed until CO2 or graphite is available for dating. This is a, pic a picture of a heterosophemal bone from Clendive, Montana, where we were able to extract bioappetite, several hundred milligrams, and even proteins, collagen, were extracted, 3.79 milligram in this heterosaur femur bone. And a C14 measurement by accelerated mass spectrometry performed in 2007 delivered a value of modern C14, a fraction of 5.59%, and the delta C13 was minus 23.7 per mil. Another specimen, this is the other source from Colorado. Here we also applied the C14 measurement to calcium carbonate from the bone appetite and obtained furthermore 2% modern of modern carbon C14 and delta C13 was minus 6.6 per mil. An earlier measurement delivered a higher value, 13.3%. We are not sure what's the reason for that. It could be that this was an older pre-treatment procedure. The triceratops bone from Montana, where we extracted proteins, collagen, delivered a value of 2.16% of modern C14 and delta C13 20, minus 20.1%. This is an overview of all the dinosaurs, of all the PMC values which we obtained for the dinosaurs we have examined. You see that they all range between around 0.7 to 6.5 percent. And we obtain similar PMC values for different fossils, different bone materials, and different bone regions where we took the sample from. Furthermore, these PMC values are distributed among different uh, deposition depths and do not depend on them, apparently. Let's look a bit more detailed into this overview. If we compare the results from samples of the same bone region, then we obtain a very good concordance between the PMC values. Here is an example of a triceratops where we uh, extracted both collagen and total organics of the same bone, bone region and we obtained around 1.5 and 2.2 percent modern carbon. Um, so this shows all dinosaurs except uh, one where we had used a very, very small sample and which delivered an un unusual high PNC value. Um, the next comparison of samples from the same bone region, this is from a patrosaur. The one value is for total organics and the neighbor value is the extracted humic acid supposed to be a contaminant, and both show very similar PMC values. This example, that's a hypersore. Both three samples stem from the same bone region again, and collagen and bioappetite, protein and mineral from this same bone region have concordant uh, amount of carbon-14. And here is an arcocantosaurus from the same bone region, we obtain in this comparison of organics and bioappetite a very nice components. And here again, uh, from the same bone region of the heterosaur, we compared the result of examination with accelerated mass spectrometer and beta mass spectrometer. The main difference is that the former can use only very small sample sizes and the later very big sample sizes. And of course, there is a resolution difference between the two AMS being capable of measuring far less CO2, C uh, carbon-14. Now this is a summary of the dinosaur delta C13 measurements. And um, 
you can observe that the minerals from all samples have concordant delta C13 values between minus 3 and minus 10 per mil, with one exception. This one is not understood. So far, then we have the collagen organics and shared bone from the uh, ex exterior of the bone. And they all have from they, they all have concordant uh, delta 13 values. C13 values between minus 17 and minus 28. This shows an overview of all the RC dating we did, not only with dinosaurs, but also with megafauna and with uh, fossil wood and so on. Uh, I hope you can read it. You see, what, this is what you have already seen in the left half. And here are the PMC values obtained for um, mammoth appetite, for uh, rhinoceros, so for, for megafauna. And this is for charcoal, uh, fossilized wood, etc. And um, uh, here we have uh, ma the matrix on top of the triceratops. It's also lying near to where we measured the triceratops itself. And here are seven values for EMBA, low but detectable uh, C14. And they stem from the Cretaceous to Eocene. So megafauna have similar PMC as their dinosaurs, obviously, in our results here. And the plant fossils have uh, consistently a lower PMC than the dinosaurs. I summarize these results from the dinosaurs. We have examined 10 different dinosaur bones from Upper Jurassic to Upper Cretaceous and they have shown measurable C14 signals. A similar PMC was observed between 0.8% to 6.5% for different fossils, different bone materials, different bone regions, and different stratigraphic positions. When the samples are taken from the same bone region, then you obtain concordant PMC for comparing appetite and collagen, for comparing appetite and total organics. You see these values and for comparing organics with extracted humic acids with uh, contaminant and concordant a a PMCs for collagen and total organics. Furthermore, you get a good agreement between beta mass spectroscopy and mass spectrometer and accelerated mass spectrometer. Fourth result, the appetites from all samples have concordant delta C13 values between minus three and minus 10 with one exception, and the, the collagen, the organics, and shared bone exterior from all samples have concordant delta C13 between minus 17 and minus 28. And finally, megafauna have similar PMC as dinosaurs, plant fossils have less than them. Now I want to discuss the origin of these results because surely the probability of contamination has to be considered here. We have the possibility that external uh, CO2 is introduced as calcium carbonate via water diffusing into the bone and uh, external organic material like humic acid is well known. However, we believe that this probability is low because of the following reasons. First of all, we have observed that there is a PMC concordance of organics and of extraction of what you extracted as humic acid. And if the PMC value of this organics stemmed entirely from the contaminant, then we would expect an intermediate PMC between contaminant and the organics, which is supposed to have no carbon-14 at all. However, they are almost the same. Then we had this PMC concordance between the small sample size and the large sample size. Uh, contamination, which might be very inhomogeneously distributed among the bone, uh, would not deliver such uh, and, uh, equality. Then we have, which is most important, the PMC concordance of different chemical fractions, minerals, collagen, and total organics. And uh, this is considered, according to Jakinski, as a very, very sure criterion that this data is reliable. Okay, and then we have um, delta C13, uh, which is typical for C3 eaters. This could be minus 80 per mil to minus 21, and we had minus um, 20. And uh, this is our result, and we have, we are, this one is our result. And this is where typically C3 eaters are lying. And this is then considered as reliable for dating. Then the matrix on top of the triceratops had a very low PMC value, 
if it were the reason for contamination, then it would have it, it would have been necessary that a lot of material would have been deposited inside the bone. A huge contamination would have been needed. And furthermore, the same pretreatment procedure as was applied to the dinosaurs was applied to the plant fossils. But the plant fossils delivered only one percent, less than one percent C14. So if contamination was at least to the amount of several percent not removable, this would have occurred in these plant fossils too. But here we see very clean samples. And another argument was that uh, the concentration of carbon, uh, when we measured it, in the vicinity of the fossils, it becomes smaller as f the further we get away from the fossil. And this indicates that the, the carbon is migrating away from the fossil, not vice versa. And uh, also an interesting yet still un not understood result, if we sort all of our results according to the PMC value, then we obtain that the PMC values are divided into uh, four distinct groups and the origin is unknown. Perhaps it is a fractionation effect. This, you find um, the same dinosaur, one fraction of the same dinosaur can be here or here, for example. Here is mainly uh, the plants. And here you have megafauna and dinosaur, as you have here and here. Um, however, inside these groups, you have a very, very good concordance. And this is unlikely that the contaminant would, would sort in such groups. We believe that this is a own property and not uh, from outside. So let me conclude and suggest for the work, further work the most important result we have found C14 in dinosaur bones, and um, we are sure that this is not coming from contaminants, but it's endogenous. The results confirm recently reported observations of soft tissue, blood cells, and sequenceable proteins in dinosaur bones and even writable ink in a fossil squid. Concordant PMC of dinosaurs and megafauna has been found which has far-reaching consequences. The results can be explained by a rapid horizontal strata formation, as is observed in laboratory experiments with moving water. Further analysis of more dinosaur bones is recommended to confirm the finding of proteins and of C14. Samples from museums and field collections would be suitable. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, unfortunately, they didn't record the uh, question at the end. Um, from what I understand, there was, in fact, only one question. Let me see if I can. August, uh, well, of uh, last year. Um, I happen to have some of the slides, so if you were going through that and trying to figure out how uh, how to read that, it, this may be a little easier for you. Um, the first slide is uh, basically they're, they're outlining, they're going to talk about why they did the test, they're going to give the uh, excavation sites and specimens, the sample pretreatment, the results, discussion, conclusions. Basically, it's fairly standard uh, outline for a, uh, for a paper. And the motivation, uh, this will be a little easier for you to read than what they had. Carbon-14 has been reported from Mesozoic, Paleozoic, carbonaceous earth materials. Um, that's uh, partly the work of the ICR and uh, partly some of the stuff that I've collected. Um, and they have read my paper. I emailed them and, and they said it had been a great help for the last three years. So obviously they've been working at this longer than, than what they've known what I've written. but. Uh, so I'm not, I won't claim credit for everything they've done, but uh, um, but that's part of what they're looking at. They're also looking at the the soft tissue that uh, Mary Schweitzer and uh, all of her colleagues have been finding in in fossils, particularly dinosaurs. And Jurassic squid ink has still has its original eumelanin, 
Hemoglobin remnants observed in Tyrannosaurus rex and Mosasaur and collagen and osteocalcin reported from Jurassic Osteoarchaeopteryx. And so they thought, well, let's um, radiocarbon date this and see what we get. And there's um, the Triceratops and the Hadrosaur deposits in the Badlands and uh, Triceratops femur boned and you can see preparation and then they've opened it up to take specimens from the inside. And here they're sawing a Triceratops femur bone, and this is where they get some of the stuff. And they, um, they didn't get stuff from the area that was cracked. They primarily tried to get the area that was not. Uh, and then they got uh, ab uh, calcium carbonate in, a, in an area that was away from uh, where their other two samples were. Um, and they're showing the... Uh, sample extraction of the Triceratops femur. Here's the hadrosaur bone with the Herversian canals. It's a little easier to see on this uh, slide. Um, and there's a sample tree treatment, which is just basically standard pretreatment. Uh, the hadrosaur femur bone from Glendive, Montana. And um, uh, then they've given some of the uh, results of that, 5.59% modern carbon. Uh, here's 2.02% uh, modern carbon from an Allosaurus bone. Um, and here's Triceratops from uh, Montana, and they did uh, 2006. Um, and here's the famous slide that you can't read on the other slide. You probably can't read it on, the <laughs> on our internet thing either because it's so small, but uh, somebody who wants it, I'll be happy to send the uh, 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 the PDF of it. Uh, there's a, the same bone region is there. Now, if you're looking at that, I'd like to see what kind of standard deviations you have. And, and um, fortunately, they include the, the numbers. And these two are, in fact, compatible with each other to the 95% confidence limits which is just about twice the 1.96 times the standard deviation. Um, and uh, this one, it's not quite as good. This is the Hadrosar number one, the uh, uh, standard, the 95% confidence limits do not overlap. Um, but uh, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that the 95% confidence limits are based on counting statistics, and they do not include other variables. And if you, re if you run a number of these things, you will find out that counting statistics are not the only source of error. And so these may very well be actually compatible with each other if you run multiple samples. Unfortunately, they didn't run enough to where you could say that for sure. Uh, at a 500 bucks a pop, you can kind of understand why they didn't do that. Um, and here's a, uh, a small bone region. And these, again, these don't quite overlap, although they're considering the standard deviations, these two do. And this one is not that far off. Again, uh, you're looking at other sources of error, I think, besides simply. But you'll notice that uh, bioappetite, that's carbon dioxide and whole bone and collagen are, con are have about the same degree of radiocarbon in them. If anything, the collagen has a little more. Uh, the collagen is equivalent to uh, whole bone extracts. Um, this will come later in the slide. This one here is uh, conventional dating. That's just putting it in the counter and seeing what you get. And this one is accelerator mass spectrometry. And you can see that they are, for all intents and purposes, identical. Uh, here's another region where, again, you'll see a little bit of difference. Um, but it's probably not significant when you take all of the sources of error into account. Um, there, here's two more. Now, why they don't mention that there's a couple of them that are off, I don't know. Um, here's our um, uh, AMS and beta, and again, that's numbers four and five on this one uh, that we just talked about. Um, 
Here, with one exception, all the delta 13 Cs are in a fairly close range to each other uh, for uh, bioappetite. And it's a much lower range, in the range of uh, about 3 to 10, than it is for the uh, collagen uh, and the whole bone uh, assay. Uh, you'll notice that the dinosaurs and megafauna uh, have, in fact, a fair amount more carbon uh, uh, 14. You'll, this is uh, a log scale. Um, then do the uh, uh, plant materials that they have been testing. Their summary is that they did 10 different dinosaur bones from Upper Jurassic to Upper Cretaceous, and they have measurable carbon-14 signals. Similar percent modern carbon for different fossils, bone material, bone regions, and stratigraphic positions. It's low, it's not zero. When you realize that the zero point for most of these labs is around uh, uh, zero, point zero seven percent. This is significantly uh, uh, significantly higher. Um, when samples are taken from the same bone region, uh, concordant percent modern carbon for appetite and collagen concordant for the, these are the things that they've already observed for you. Um, Appetites from all samples have concordant uh, delta-13 carbon uh, between 3 and 10, with one exception. And the collagen and organics are, have a higher range, which is what you'd expect. Uh, the megafauna have a similar percent modern carbon as dinosaurs, and plants have less percent modern carbon. And they're arguing that the probability of contamination is fairly low. Primarily because of all this concordance, if it was contamination, how does it contaminate the bioappetite at just about the same rate as it does the collagen? Well, furthermore, how do you contaminate collagen? Uh, once you purify it out, bacteria don't make collagen. Uh, collagen isn't made all by itself. It's probably original. And how would you get carbon-14 into that? Um, they're mentioning that there are higher concentrations of carbon near the dinosaur bones and then for lower concentrations further away, which suggests that carbon is diffusing out um, and not diffusing in very rapidly. So where's, where do the contaminators, presumably bacteria, uh, get enough carbon-14 with modern carbon to put into the bones to, because, you see, diffusing out doesn't matter. It's only if you can get modern carbon in. And you have to get, if it's 5% modern carbon, that means you have to get 5% of the bone replaced by modern carbon in order to make it all contamination. And finally, he, he notes that there appear to be four ranges that are somewhat separate from each other. Um, arguing that there's, uh, that this is not a continuous distribution. Uh, it's a, a weak argument, but it's probably at least uh, a reasonable one. Um, and their conclusions is that it's carbon-14 in dinosaur bones has been detected, which is likely endogenous. Now, the importance of that is that if you have bone that's about 228,000 years old. It should, if it started out with today's carbon-14 to ordinary carbon ratio, you should have less than one atom of carbon per gram of, uh, atom of carbon-14 per gram of carbon. And if you're measuring a milligram size sample and you're using maybe 2% of that for the actual assay, you shouldn't find any carbon-14 in it, period. Uh, in a million years, you can decay the entire Earth's weight of carbon-14 and have it uh, completely gone except for one atom, and that atom has a greater than 99% chance 
of decaying. Which means if you've got 65 million year old stuff and it has endogenous carbon-14, it isn't that old. Um, and they're saying that this confirms the uh, finding of soft tissue, blood, sequ uh, blood cell sequenceable protein in dinosaur bones, writable ink in a fossil squid, and uh, um, the results, they say, can be explained by rapid horizontal strata formation as observed in laboratory experiments with moving water, where you can form multiple strata at one time with things sorting out. Um, further analysis of more dinosaur bones is recommended to confirm the findings of protein and carbon-14. Ah, this is a good idea. Let's do some more of it. Um, Why'd the paper disappear? Well, we don't know from the people who made it disappear, but the people who made the presentation asked, and this is the answer they got. The abstract was removed from the conference website by two chairmen because they could not accept the findings. Now, this is, of course, their editorial comment, unwilling to challenge the data openly. They erased the report from public view. That much is a fact. Without a word to the authors or even to the AOGS <coughs> officers until after an investigation. And the comment is that it won't be restored. In other words, what you see now is what you get. Now, my own personal view on it, I think the presentation is a reasonable one. It's not perfect. Most presentations aren't. Uh, there are surface reasons to challenge it. You could say, well, contamination could theoretically count for the findings of differing carbon-14 ordinary carbon ratios in different parts of the bone. And different things are contaminated differently, and that's why. But it's difficult to maintain as a complete ex explanation because you have to explain how you can take 5% of the bone. That's 1 20th of the material and it has to be exchanged in the last 6,000 years. Either there's something special about the last 6,000 years, and why you pick 6,000, because the half-life is 5,730. If you replace it 12,000 years ago, you have to replace double that. And if you replace it, um, uh, if you replace it uh, 18,000 years, you have to do triple that. Uh, no, excuse me, four times that. Um, well, if you do it 25,000 or 30,000 years ago, you have to replace the entire bone. So it has to be done in the last 6,000 years uh, for it to be reasonable. But if that's been going on for the last 65 million years, why isn't the entire bone replaced? Well, beyond 50,000 years, unless you have very persnickety um, uh, experimental conditions, you, you can't distinguish it from zero. Now, the oldest date in the literature is actually done by Irv Taylor and his uh, colleagues, and it's 80,000 years on a diamond. And at that level, I can accept that as being contamination. Uh, maybe it isn't, but it could be. So among diamonds of wool evolutionists, do they accept that limitation of carbon-14 years? Oh, yeah. And so basically you have to come up with two different explanations for carbon-14 in very old material. Um, the one is that the laboratories are no good, which is another way of saying our data is, is faulty, um, which could be true, but... Um, uh, when all of it's faulty to about the same amount in the same direction, you begin to wonder. Uh, the, the second uh, way to explain it is to say that carbon-14 is being made in the sample by neutrons. Problem is there aren't enough neutrons. The people who've done that throw that out and don't do the math behind it. The question is why are we fleshing this 
presentation down the memory hole. I mean, they can disagree with it. No, nobody believes every presentation that's given at a particular meeting. You know, why not just leave it there and, you know, laugh at it as a support creationist or something? Um, I think that you can say that there are four classes of creationist research. Some of them that make creationism harder to maintain. Yes, that does happen on occasion. And of course, those are eminently publishable. The journals would be happy to have those. Those that are neutral, they discuss subjects that have nothing to do with creation and evolution, and creationists can publish that in all they want to. Nobody really cares. Those that solve problems for creationism, but don't particularly make life hard for an evolutionary uh, and long age uh, type of belief. And those ones can be published too if you're careful to not overstate your findings. Things like the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, you can publish them in the, the general literature. Things like uh, Coconino Sandstones and whether they were laid underwater. As, as long as you've got good reasons, they'll say, sure, fine, well, water, air, whatever. They don't care. But if you strike at the heart of atheism, and there are two major classes, and there are probably a few others that people can come up with, um, those that show the need for an intelligent designer, them's fighting words. People will do things like what happened to Steve Meyer's article and then Robert, uh, uh, Robert Sternberg? Richard Sternberg. Uh, uh, anyway, the, the editor who accepted the article uh, basically got hounded for something like five, six years before he finally found a job elsewhere. And the article was voted out of existence. It basically, they said it didn't happen. Um, and, well, we'll save that comment. Uh, those that present a um, strong argument for short age are in the same boat. They can't have this in the literature because then they'd have to argue against it. And they'd have to argue against it with data and they might not get it. Um, now, theoretically, if you really believe, there shouldn't be a problem. We'll just go out and do our own boat, bone dating. I think the latter will only get published if someone doesn't realize what he's publishing. It, uh, or doesn't realize the stakes, or perhaps has this misguided idea that science is supposed to be open to all ideas. Uh, one, I don't think one has to be completely venal and cynical, although certainly it helps, to oppose such research being published. Um, I think you can actually simply know that the opposition can't possibly be right. So there must be some flaw in the research, and the, this research will be unfairly damaging if it's published. And besides, you know those guys, they publish stuff that's off the wall. I mean, it supports creations and everybody knows it's wrong. They have to be either really ignorant or dishonest to do that. Now, I will have to say that Sometimes we on the creationist side are tempted to do this, and some of us have been known to do it. And so I, I think we need to be careful about being, coming down too hard on people on the other side who do the same thing. But that's my take. And um, I will now leave the floor open for comments and questions. Well, I'll just uh, mention first, of course, uh, the neutron picture, I think, has been pretty well negated by that decrease in carbon-14 from around where the dinosaurs are. We go further out. Why would neutrons all concentrate on a dinosaur? Uh, it's very hard to explain. 
And so uh, I think that's, that's not a, a valid argument. I think bacterial contamination is not a valid argument from two perspectives, one that's too consistent, the data is too consistent for this. And, I, and you know, they purified their stuff pretty well, I think. And it, uh, uh, collagen you know, does that. Uh, I'm, cur I'm curious, do you happen to know, did they think these folks were creationists? And when, when they talked about you know, multiple de sedimentary deposits, uh, they did not say Genesis flood, but I think they were getting very close to a very sensitive issue because you know, the flood is what explains the geologic column in the creation model. Uh, did these folks, were they aware of this and so on? I, uh, I have, uh, it seems to me they must have, uh, like you reasoned uh, at the end there, uh, th there's a great component of self-deception out there. And uh, we are all subject to uh, self-deception. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we don't believe in uh, flying spaghetti monsters, for instance. And uh, they don't believe in creation. And they're sure they're right. Like, this, we're sure that flying uh, spaghetti monsters don't exist. I can follow their reasoning to a certain extent. Uh, as I see this, uh, how do you change uh, such a deep ingrained ethos and it has become uh, more ingrained, I think, uh, recently than it was uh, at first uh, uh, and the creation is ridiculed. And this goes through the whole intellectual community as something that you make fun of, kind of, and so on. And of course, no student or scientist wants to be subjected to criticism and, and to this type of um, ridicule. But there, how do you help out? people who have this ethos. Uh, there's no question. Well, actually, I think that there's a, there is a, a very simple answer to that. And that is the American Medical Association for a long time fought against Laetrile as an effective cancer treatment. And they badmouthed it mm -hmm. and they wouldn't mm -hmm. let people talk about it and they basically they did what these guys are doing. Um, and they said the other guys are just in it for the money and so forth and so on. Um, and it didn't go anywhere. And finally, somebody said, well, let's just do a test. And so they did a standard, just like we would try test uh, standard cancer chemotherapy agents. They did Laetrile the same way. And it failed and all of a sudden, most of the controversy went away. And, and see, the thing of it is, what people are doing is they're trying not to have to do the hard work of actually doing the scientific study. Well, uh, I mean, American Medical Association took a huge risk on that uh, by, by simply, uh, you know, allowing this stuff to be tested. Of course, if you look at it from a, from a more <laughs> rational perspective, hey, if Laetrile works, I want to know about it. So rather than just simply saying, oh, those guys, they're, you know, they're, they're non-professionals, they're making huge piles of money, you know, something is wrong, it, uh, vitamin C will cost you, what, you know, $1,000 if you want to do that. Laetrile would cost mm -hmm. you your house. So you can see why people would mm -hmm. make those kinds of comments. But still, the answer is, look at it. Fine. And, and once we get past this point where we're gonna argue that they couldn't mm -hmm. possibly be right because we know they're wrong, and we start saying, 
Well, let's look at it and see what the data actually shows. Then I think we can get somewhere. Well, yeah, I, I, I hope I hope you're right. I would argue that uh, it takes more than that to do it because look at all the problems that evolution has. And data has shown it, whether you go to the fossil record, where they go to the genetics record. Uh, residual carbon-14 has been out there for quite a while, uh, and so on. Uh, societies tend to adopt paradigms and ridicule anything else. I'm, let, let's go back to uh, Plato, age of reason. Thought was superior to matter. Uh, dark ages, uh, or middle ages is probably a better term for it. Uh, respect for authority, especially Aristotle and so on. Uh, that was the dominant idea. Since 1850, kind of, uh, 1844, uh, the uh, materialism has dominated uh, at least the scientific community. Uh, but materialism, uh, it seems to me we ought to work and try and convince these people materialism is way too simple for reality. Don't give us a simplistic model. Uh, they feel justified in doing this. Well, they think, oh, this is, this is, creation's got to be wrong, you know? Man, it's so many problems of evolution. Uh, and you, you get into uh, carbon for, well, you residual carbon 14 like this. Sure, it's there. Uh, this is, we, we remove the papers, we don't believe it. Uh, paraconformities, uh, extremely widespread layers out there. I mean, this is, this is, uh, good data that would help in all this, but how do you change a society? Uh, that's the question I'd raise. Maybe one person at a time. <laughs> Go ahead. Just a couple quick questions. Um, one is, you alluded to, and I thought you were going to address the idea of, are they n known creationists, or do you know anything about these men? Number two is, is there a precedent for uh, removing papers and just the whole, ev just any inkling of that it was ever presented from uh, some present, well, you know, a conference like this? Has it happened before? I don't know that I have seen it before. I, I, you've probably been more, uh, uh, but papers that just disappeared. I can tell you that I had, I had a... Several of them have slipped in there. Uh, uh, have if you seen you, papers if you, just disappear? Uh, not disappear, not that many. I don't think, this is, this is unusual. And this is uh, blatant ignorance of data. I, I, I mean, I, 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 and I, I can understand why they did it, because, you know, they, they've, they're, they're self-deceived. And we're all subject to self-deception, uh, but uh, usually they don't do this. I mean, this is uh, blatant. What? Are they creation? Are they creation? Are they are they creation? They're an interesting breed. These are Catholic creationists. Now that means that. <laughs> Either their religious motivation is because they are literally more Catholic than the Pope, <laughs> or else they have some scientific motivation as well. Is that it's the only way I can say it? There, there is a used to be at least a Catholic Christian side so used to uh, uh, ask us for permission to publish uh, articles from Origins. Uh, they were a Catholic organization. Origins, of course, is one put out by the Geoscience Research Institute. 
but uh, but apparently, uh, you know, the, the Pope himself has said, well, evolution is more than a theory, and that kind of implies that he's willing to let the long ages um, go ahead. Um, yeah, because that Pope is dead, and another one is sick. And the I one interestingly, that's he's a Polish Pope. And which raises some very interesting questions about this well, uh, Gierczyk fellow. The new one's Argentina, you know. I wonder what he's... He hasn't touched this, this issue no, yet. No, he hasn't yet. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what he does. Um, yes, uh, Nick. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> is this working? Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, these things don't happen just in uh, academia or uh, uh, regular uh, non-Adventist or non-Christian uh, institutions. Uh, yesterday I went to look for a paper I posted on uh, an Adventist uh, media. Club Adventist, I don't know how many of you are familiar with. In the, uh, my paper disappeared, and it said the, uh, it, the, the message says it, it was moved. So I clicked to find out where, where it was. Well, it's a blank paper. So it disappeared without any, you know, real reason why, because the editor doesn't like what I said there. It's evident. Now, my question regarding this uh, situation is, did you say something about the editor who originally allowed this to be published? Uh, I thought you, you, s you made a comment, but I didn't quite get it. Uh, no, that was another paper where the editor was hounded out of office after five years. It hasn't been five years for this, and uh, uh, yeah, his name is Richard von Sternberg. If you if you Google Stern, uh, Richard Sternberg, you'll get, uh, you should be able to get the story. It's quite an interesting one. Now, something else I, I'd like to add. D did you or any others try to write to this institution? The reason I'm saying this is because, you know, is some of you are familiar with Advindicate. That's a cons conservative uh, publication, Adventist publication. Uh -huh independent and uh, I was commenting the, there on several issues and uh, some of the things I, I said uh, would also disappear and then one, uh, one person uh, posted the following comment I'd like to hear from Nick what he wants to say about abortion would you allow him to write a paper? And the, uh, uh, Shane Hilde said, sure, you know, he can go ahead. And I did write the paper, waited two or three months, and I was sure, 100% sure, that it would never happen. And I even told my wife, don't expect a miracle. Well, lo and behold, one day, I was looking at the uh, new stuff, and there was something familiar, and that was my, my paper. <laughs> it was published, and now uh, th there are over 200 comments already and going on. So I was wondering, are you planning to write to this uh, organization, or uh, do you know of any other individual? Because if somebody raises the issue, and if there's enough uh, complaints, maybe a miracle would take place. Well, I eventually I plan to uh, send an inquiry when I figure out who I should be asking. Um, I uh, I haven't done so yet, so I can't really say that they haven't responded. Uh, I don't know whether it will make much good, but um, uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see. We have a comment here and one back there, but first I should point out that it is now 
past 11.30. So we're kind of doing this on non-company time at this point. <laughs> Go ahead. What I'm wanting to know is these guys that did this research, are they doing something really unusual or why isn't anybody else coming up with the same research or the same results? Um, there were other people who were going to do carbon-14 dating on the bones to try to prove that the stuff in them was recent and therefore it was contamination and therefore Mary Schweitzer's uh, findings were all uh, bogus. But have they? Uh, I don't know that they have published. Uh, they may have done so and it has escaped my notice. There were several papers uh, trying to suggest these were bacterial films that uh, Schweitzer w was dealing with. Were any of them, were any of them it used carbon-14 as a... No, no. They, and they've been more or less rejected. I think Schweitzer is winning the case. Yeah. <coughs> Go ahead. This study doesn't do it for me. I'm wondering if there's still some faulty understanding of carbon-14 because bringing the dinosaurs from 250 million years down to 60,000 years still doesn't bring it down within 6,000 years. Well, I'll point out that it's more like 30,000 to begin with. But the second thing you have to realize is that if all the dinosaurs were living at the same time as all the coal was living, as all the coal was living, the vegetation at the, the same coal. time as all of the shells that have been buried in limestone, maybe not the limestone itself, but certainly the shells, um, you have a tremendous amount of carbon-12 uh, exchanging carbon with the atmosphere. Now, what you measure when you measure a carbon-14 age is not actually the age itself. What you measure is the ratio of carbon-14 to ordinary carbon. And you express that as a percentage of what they call the modern carbon-14 level. It's not actually the modern carbon-14 level. All of us right now are about 110 to 115 percent modern. That is to say, if you were to judge us, if you were to take our carbon-14 dates and put it into the machine and crank, you would say that we are living um, several centuries into the future. That's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> I understand how perfectly the system works. Okay, but, but 18, 1850 is considered modern. That's before most of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and so if you take the 1850 level and you project it back, um, uh, you know, what you're, what you're actually saying is that if it started at the 1850 level and it came down to, to where it is now, it would have taken 30,000 years. But you see, if it didn't start at the 1850 level, if it started at, let's say, 2% or 5%, <coughs> then all it would have taken is maybe 6,000 years, maybe 4,000 years. From carbon-14 alone, you can't limit it to 30,000 years. That's a projected age using a standard that, frankly, nobody believes anymore. Most of the time, of course, they believe that the carbon-14 level actually was a little bit higher in the past than they do now. Uh, creationists tend to believe precisely the reverse, that carbon-14 was lower. And so those things that are dating at 30,000 or so years are actually dating to the flood, uh, not to 30,000 years. The creationists have no problem with the 30,000 year age for a dinosaur. It's the, in fact, if anything, it's a little bit more recent than I would have expected. It's the, uh, it's the evolutionists that have the big problem because you can't go back 65 million years. Something has happened recently. Uh, yeah, it, it's just that so many of these dates from coal 
and uh, I don't, some diamonds, we might say, and so on, are in this kind of range that it suggests that the level of carbon-14 was somewhere. Now, these dates are a little bit younger than I'd have hoped for. Uh, because uh, it would have been nice if they were all right at 48,000 yeah, years, and then yeah, you could say, so, well, that's uh, what it is. But uh, I think you'd expect some variability uh, in this. You, you go to the uh, shoreline here and Cal pick up some of the living uh, organism. You date them by carbon-14, you date uh, a mollusk shell, you know, and so on. You're going to get several hundred years old for a living shell. If you're in Peru, it's even worse. It may be... Oh, you get several thousand. Yeah. And, of course, you get 26,000 or 27,000, I don't know, somewhere like that. In Nevada, you pick up some living snails. Cause because they eat, of, uh, they eat material that's grown off of carbon dioxide that's very, very old that's because it's been, um, you know, in terms so of... So the model we're playing with is that this represents the level of carbon-14 before the flood. Uh, and the 40,000, well, you know, that's just the ratio. Are there any other radiometric dating methods that parallel the same results? Uh, beryllium-10 probably uh, fits somewhere into there. There's a fascinating study that was done on volcanoes where they measured the levels of beryllium-10 in, uh, in the volcanic eruption material, you know, lava, and got all the modern volcanoes. And then somebody had the bright idea of doing um, the uh, uh, Columbia basalt, which is supposed to be 18 million years old. And it's a 1.5 million year half-life. And they were getting modern levels. <laughs> what I'd love to see is somebody do the Deccan traps in India and see if you get modern levels there. But of course that's not something that a, an evolutionist would ever do because they know that it can't have any uh, beryllium-10 because it should be all decayed away. I think our last questioner, Dave, was asking about are there any other methods comparable to what we're talking about, dating organic material? Is there anything other? Carbon-14 is probably the best for organic, but are there yeah. other methods coming up with these anomalous ages? Well, actually, amino acid dating did. <laughs> The a fascinating article by Dr. Robert Brown, who is now deceased, um, uh, and Arlo Roth was the editor at the time, and I, I don't think either of them could quite believe what they were seeing. Sure. I'll just comment. When I saw that manuscript, I told myself, I can't believe, I, I just saw it. He, he just showed me the thing, and I looked through it. And I, I saw this diagram, and we've got hundreds, uh, I should say a hundred, hundred, at least a hundred, probably a hundred dates, carbon-14 dates that get older as you go down the geo, I mean, uh, amino, amino acid, acid dates, yeah. as you go down, as you go down the thing, I told myself, I know science is not that bad. I took the article home, I went through all the equations, the, so on. I thought, something is tricky here to do that. It can't be that bad that you have such a consistent increase in age as you go down the GRI column with amino acid dating. And to get these older dates, you have to... The constant uh, goes down. Increase yeah. the decay constants. And it was a thousand times slower for the decay in the older dates. Did you go out and look up, up any of the, of the original data to make sure that he got it right? I have not done that per se. I, I sent the article, I went, saw I like, one of the scientists I trusted around here, I, he, and he, he said, this is correct, there's no question about it. And the thing demonstrates actually that uh, these older things, 
I don't know, it goes probably maybe 50, does it go 50,000 years? I don't know, somewhere. Something like it's, that. It's near the top of the Jericho. But uh, it demonstrates that all this stuff is fairly young according to amino acid, acid racemization. It, it is uh, unbelievable that there was such an obvious trend that was erroneous in amino acid racemization, and this was ignored. Well, you know, uh, you believe what you want to believe. I'll get back to my question now. I just wanted to follow up. This was a very good question here. Um, okay, a lot of these uh, anomalous things like amino acids are dealing with post-flood material, right? And most everyone's, mm, most of, most most everyone's flood model. That. Most everyone. Yeah. Uh, now, there's a quite a number of creationists, even some Adventists, who put most of the tertiary or Cenozoic after the flood. Um, Andrew Snelling, uh, prominent creationist, and so on. So what we need to look at is what we can really prove would be antediluvian, which would be Paleozoic, Mesozoic, basically, maybe a little bit of lower tertiary. What kind of dates do we get in the range of, let's say, 30,000 years, carbon-14, for any of that, whether it's shell material or coal or animal bone? Um, you've covered a lot of the literature. Can you shed any light on what we're getting for clearly uh, antediluvian material? For clearly antediluvian? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's uh, that's one of the things that uh, that the ICR did uh, with my strong encouragement um, was that they did coal from all three eras. And do we have thirty thousand year radiocarbon? No, actually, coal? what we have is more like about forty five thousand. But it's uh, sure. if I can put it this way, it's a zero point five percent modern carbon. 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 .4, depending on which specimens you're talking about. And they're not segregated according to, in other words, the highest and the second highest are in Paleozoic, uh, pardon me, the highest and the second lowest, and the second highest and the lowest are actually in, um, in Mesozoic and the Cenozoic mm -hmm. fall within that range, and so th that it, there appears to be there appears to be a a more or less level all the way across. And where is this published? I'm a librarian. I need documentation. Oh uh, <laughs> well, it's published in the second rate book. Okay. It's also published in the Proceedings of the Fifth uh, International Conference on um, uh, Creationism. Right. Um, although the more complete one is the rate book. And the rate book one, by the way, is available on the net. Good. So uh, um, just to follow up, why should we not expect to get something 30,000 year range that we're getting with this latest study you just presented? Well, so I would have expected it to be matching the coal. And I still Why that direction? Why not this direction? This is oh, the no. youngest. What we're looking at is trying getting younger and younger and younger. Yeah, but so you see, it, what's, what's hard to explain is why the Cretaceous coal doesn't date the same as the Cretaceous dinosaurs. Yeah, and that's part of my question, but we haven't reconciled that yet. No, we haven't. Now, the thing I can tell you is that when Andrew Snelling did a number of uh, kind of hit or miss things before they actually went after it big, um, that he was getting stuff that's in the range of the dinosaurs. Yeah. So well I don't know why the coal is all low. Even even the Eocene coal is low. Right. Yeah. That's that could be um, antediluvian. Um, right. I I'm so I mean it's starting to look like from the carbon fourteen data uh, maybe some of the stuff that we're considering as uh, as a post flood maybe really isn't. And one of the things we're going to try to be doing shortly is 
Uh, we have some material from the Bridger Formation, turtles and various other things. And uh, we're going to start doing some carbon-14 dates on those. That's long overdue. Uh, I, I think it is long overdue. But, you know, you, you think about it. There's, there's two things. Well, there are actually three things. Number one, you have to think about doing the test to begin with. Number two, you have to have enough expertise to at least know where to get the dates. And number three, you have to have the money. Yeah. And, you know, 500 bucks a pop, you don't just throw that stuff away. Yeah, I would add, I would add uh, look at all the dates they had here. I mean, this is, this is t tells you when you ask a question, you get yourself into very deep issues, and it takes a lot of money to do that. But the, I think they did a fairly representative sampling. Uh, they just didn't. They just didn't one didn't do one sample here. Uh, this is a fairly significant paper. I, I hope somehow or other it gets gets out there. Well, it is out there now. It's just that it's not. It's not out where it ought to be. Yeah, uh, but I would I would add to Warren's question. Uh, I'm not that comfortable with. Uh, the flood is Paleozoic and Mesozoic. Uh, I know the tertiary is different to a certain extent, but uh, man, well, almost all your orders of mammals, almost all your orders of birds are tertiary. Were they not involved in the flood? How do you have a flood without those animals? Well, you I, see, I the pre-flood pre world was all yeah. reptilian, except for humans. Yeah, well, I don't accept that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, go ahead, and then we'll have a comment behind you. Just a qu another quick question. Um, how, co how could one determine what's pre-flood and post-flood? I mean, it was all here before, right? <coughs> all that was he is here now was here before the flood, maybe in a different form. Is that the, is that the issue? Or well, uh, uh, that's a hard thing. concept for me. To there, uh, there's a lake where the Green River cuts through, <coughs> which is alleged by certain people to be the center of the universe. Uh, <laughs> in some uh, places, in some places, the flood may have ended at a lower part in the geodetic comb than other places. I mean, it, it's it, a, it's a very complex question. Uh, furthermore, you know, we have floods right now that produce the same kind of sediments that you'd expect during the Genesis floods. So you're not going to have. It's not an easy question to answer, and it has not been answered adequately. And, and one, of the, one of the things we need is more data. The problem, of course, is that data costs money. And it also costs energy and time. Because you, in order to do this, you have to actually f find something that will, will contain it. And you have to, you're going to have to probably wear uh, some kind of gloves to keep your hands from contaminating this stuff, you know. And, um, and you're going to have to keep it from being contaminated either by, you know, oil from your drill or, uh, I mean, you, there's a lot of things you have to think about. Uh, uh, it's not just a matter of, oh, well, let's just send it in and get a date. Um, uh, because they won't accept a big box full of material. They're going to have to have a little bit better package than that. And contamination, it, it takes just a little bit to produce these very old dates. It takes very slight contamination will do it, so you, you've got to be extremely yeah. careful. Although now that we're talking about 5%, you have to have a fairly significant, that's a lot of contamination, if that's really contamination. You've partly answered my first question, which is why does it cost so much? Mass spectrometry has been around for years. Why should it be that expensive to run a sample? Obviously the, the, the contamination the problems are real, but... That's number one. But the other thing is you have to remember that the people who are doing this, um, the, the machine is, you know, has maybe a million volts in the middle of it. Uh, it's a big machine that covers an entire room. It's sort of like having a CAT scan that, you know, the actual cost of running the machine is perhaps $150 with counting the uh, you know, a lot, and then you have to add the text time and the person to read it, but, but, but the actual running of the machine is not all that expensive, but just to have the machine. And so what you have to do is you have to either have some wealthy donor give the machine 
or else you have to amortize it over the life of the specimens that it's going to run. So you wind up with something that's more expensive. I can tell you that if you've got an end to the group, it's more like $250. Um, but of course, most creationists don't have an end to <laughs> the group. So. My other question was the variability in the, in the results. Do we have old material that, that has wide variability in the uh, percent of carbon-14 or? <coughs> it depends on the material and some of it you do. Um, uh, there isn't very much data on this. But what little data we do have suggests that there is considerable more variability than, than we have at present, for, for that matter. Do, uh, we, do we know of any good solid sample that doesn't have carbon-14 in it? Yeah. There is one reported in the literature, and it was not reproducible. So I don't know what, what you can say about that. You know, I mean, when it, when it doesn't work all the time and work well with other things at the same time, in other words, your standards don't come out, uh, somebody hasn't carefully calibrated the standards and, 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 and then run the sample and, and, and keep getting the same answer. If you, don't, if you don't have that kind of reproducibility, you know, something may have been off in the machine and the beam is just a little bit, uh, not quite the magnetic field it used to be and the, the the thing overshoots and, and runs into the side of the machine, and then you, you, you get no counts when you really have, you know, 500. So that's one of the reasons why you have to be, uh, you have to not only be careful, but you have, to, you have to do repeated analyses. Because if you don't do repeated analyses, you don't know for sure that everything's working the way it's cracked up to be. You can't see this stuff. It's not like you can, you know, just saw into it and, oh, that looks orange. I mean, you know. <laughs> It's, uh, you're, dealing with, you're dealing with literally single atoms that you're counting, one at a time. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not what you'd set your third grader to do. Um, Well, there's, I think there's one at UCLA, there's one at Irvine. Uh, Irvine is the one that Irv Taylor works at. Um, they have a new design, it's a little smaller than most, but, and it only runs up to a million volts instead of four million. Um, but it seems to be doing the trick pretty well. And they got some wonderful data on diamonds out of it. Uh, wonderful from our perspective too, but that's a different <laughs> issue. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, uh, Nick, and then uh. okay. I'm trying to understand uh, Ariel's comment that contamination produces old ages. Does that mean that there was some material corresponding to that a old age? In other words, let's say you have a bone. You're trying to determine the age of that bone. But contamination shows that, or seems to show, that the bone uh, existed uh, uh, 50,000 years or whatever. Does that mean that there was something that produces that old age? In other words, there was something that existed 50,000 years ago instead of 6,000 or 10,000? No, what it means is that the ratio of carbon-14 to ordinary carbon in the source was that low. It could have been, you know, carbon that uh, last mixed with the biosphere 50,000 years ago, or it could have been carbon that mixed with the biosphere that was much lower only 4,000 years ago. Uh, the only reason that we won't, don't postulate that it could have happened, let's say, 1,000 years ago is because we have historical records that go beyond that and we're pretty confident that, uh, that uh, 
the uh, age for uh, the amount of carbon-14 in the biosphere at that time uh, was approximately what it is today within about 3%. For, for a number of samples, you can, uh, by purification processes, get rid of the problem of contamination. You can't in some, in some cases, but you can in some cases do it. So, uh, and usually they try for, I mean, this is, this is a, a very serious problem, yeah. but it's usually taken care of by uh, careful uh, chemical isolation. You know that one slide that, that had the process that went down? Um, that's the standard process, and they put acid on it, and then they put strong alkali. It's like 1% hydrogen peroxide, 1% uh, sodium hydroxide or something like that. And then they put acid on it again trying to get rid of all the humic acid that they possibly can. And then they finally, then they go down to uh, 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 processing the material, actually turning it into carbon dioxide and, and uh, measuring it. Uh, but they, they put some pretty evil stuff on it to try to get everything they can off of it. And most of the time they succeed pretty well. The record of the Dead Sea Scrolls is amazingly good and it's only the undated scrolls that have the problem, and they're about 40 years off. And I think the reason they're 40 years off is because they were trying to protect the Daniel scroll, <laughs> which otherwise would have been too old. Psychological contamination. What? This is psychological psychological contamination. Psychological contamination. <laughs> but that's that's a whole a whole different issue, and uh, <laughs> we won't go into that now. <laughs> Just more back on this uh, pre-flood, post-flood. I'm wondering what would they be, what would satisfy even a creationist that uh, a rock was pre-flood? If it, if they think it was never touched by the flood, is that the thing? Or and then mm. these other rocks are have been reformed and because of the lava and the melting and all that and the sandstone and coming together. Those were those would be considered a recent post-flood construction? But I, I don't... That's there, there's a, there's, a, there's a big debate, and, and uh, it, it centers primarily around flowering plants. The traditional creationist view, and I think it's probably the one that people still, most people still would buy, is that the Cambrian, pre-Cambrian boundary is pretty much where the flood started that that's why the Cambrian explosion, suddenly you have all these animals where you didn't have them before is because during the pre-flood depositions, there was plenty of time for any animals that got there to be scavenged and you know eaten out and basically you wouldn't have any fossils left. And that's what happens most of the time with fossils, if you think about it. There are what, millions of bison that uh, used to roam the plains. You can't find a fossil of one of those. You know, uh, and the reason why is because the coyotes and the vultures and the <laughs> rats gnawed on the, the bones after everything else was gone, and eventually it all disappeared. Um, and that's what happens to most things. And down in the sea, the same thing happens. A whale dies six months later; it's barely recognizable. Uh, two or three years later, you're having a hard time finding trace traces. And you know, probably two or three decades, and it's all muck. Uh, and that's a big animal. And of course, that has implications for the Pisco Formation in uh, in Peru, because you have these all these whales that are beautifully preserved. They can't have been sitting down there for six months at a time, slowly having the diatoms filter over them. You know, just that's not that's not a rational uh, proposition. You know, when you can still find the baleen stuck to their teeth, to their, uh, to their uh, jaw bones, and that's just not, yeah. not rational. Um, so it would be the rocks around where the fossils are? What? Or how the is rocks that around those rocks? particular fossils. Well, but you're asking, the question we're coming back rocks. to is, why do some people say, well, it wasn't really the Cambrian, maybe some of this was early? 
And the reason that they will say that is because Eden had, as far as we can tell, flowering plants. And shortly after Eden, we had grass. And the flowering plants don't show up in the record until Cretaceous, Cretaceous. maybe a little bit in the Jurassic. There's been a report of Jurassic uh, lily pollen, I think, but uh, pollen can s filter down through rocks. Uh, yeah. So it's just not a good, it's not a good criterion. Yeah, as a matter of fact, there's this big brouhaha in Venezuela over, uh, over pollen and Precambrian stuff, so that, <laughs> it gets interesting. Uh, before that, there was a brouhaha in the, about pollen in the Grand Canyon, and I think that was, to most people's point of view, resolved in favor of the uh, transport. Uh, although there's some creationists that are still willing to say no, that was for real. There's Cambrian pollen in India. In, mm -hmm. in the uh, Cambrian in India, and then there's, there's a big debate over whether it's really Cambrian yeah. and whether there's really pollen. If you think about it, once you start having those kinds of things happen, there's going to be all kinds of arguments over what happened to this or that because people will do what they've done with the Schweitzer stuff. You know, some people will say, well, it just can't last that long, therefore it isn't there. And Schweitzer will come back and say, but it is there. And of course, they're both right is the problem. <laughs> would would pre-flood rocks be those that have no fossil evidence in them at all? Is that what they were looking uh, That's kind of what they're saying is that the pre f the, the, uh, before the actual flood, that the, that the fossils would be extremely rare and limited to, to chance burials. Well, and well, chance burials would be much less likely mm -hmm. pre-flood than they are now because of the weather pattern. Uh, yeah. Things aren't that yeah. simple. Uh, you could have had some fossilization before the flood. Uh, well, certainly, could have. certainly coral reefs, which grow, they produce their fossils as they grow because they build on each other. And that could have easily happened before the flood. So as you can see, it's complicated. Not, and, and perhaps even a fossil, uh, a fossil coral bed could wind up getting buried in what is now called the Ordovician. Mm -hmm. But it's really pre-flood. So, because it, during the flood you could have had transport all over the place. That's what a uh, worldwide flood would be expected to do. Okay. Right. So uh, you asked. It's a tough question. It, it's 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 not an easy Getting one. Getting the idea. And one of the problems is that we're too quick to make a good scientific model and hold to it. Uh, one of the models that I used to hold to and had to pretty much abandon because of literature is that all over the world, carbon-14 should be pretty much the same for the antediluvian community. Um, and there are, there's an erroneous assumption that supported that, and the data is against it, and so I think that I would have to say that no, carbon-14 around the world was not even before the flood. Um, the erroneous assumption that supported that is it's spread all over mo in modern times. Uh, we doubled the concentration of carbon-14 in the Northern Hemisphere by putting bombs that had neutrons running all over the place and hitting nitrogen-14 and turning it into carbon-14, which is the normal way of making carbon-14. And um, it's an NP reaction, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but the but that assumes that we have weather, weather patterns like we have now with a jet stream going at 100 miles an hour with, the, um, uh, with you know, hurricanes blowing stuff you know, clear uh, you know, up from the tropics into the, and, and being very efficient mixing systems with normal winds being you know, 20, 30 miles an hour in a lot of places. Um, Good to see you. When you have that, then carbon-14 mixes very well. But what if you had a flood where there wasn't rain, where it was a kind of a dew that settled on everything? That's what the record seems to indicate. 
Uh, there was no rain before the flood. Then, then the mixing that we have now would not be as strong. You might even have a kind of a temperature inversion kind of thing to where the f vertical mixing wasn't very strong and all the carbon-14 was sitting up in the, a the stratosphere where it's normally made instead of getting mixed down with underheads and stuff like that. So uh, all of a sudden you're, you're looking at it in an entirely different ecosystem and to assume that it should mix just as well as we mix today is, well, it's a nice first assumption, but you better hold it pretty lightly. And if you have evidence to the contrary, you have to say, well, it just didn't happen. Um, in response to the question, uh, would there be any fossils before the flood? Uh, you go down into the valley of the Savannah River in um, Tennessee, you drill down 200 meters, 600 feet. You look down there, you find some algae. We're talking about simple organisms that require light. What are they doing 200 meters down? Obviously, they've been transported in there. And um, the paper says, well, uh, either algae live a long time or the there's been the contamination here. Well, uh, so were the sediments before the flood? Yes. Uh, could algae have gone down 200 meters? Yes. Into Precambrian sediments? Yes. Uh, it's uh, so the, the, the picture is complex, but the, the Cambrian explosion is a, a real landmark that uh, kind of cries out. Hey, hey, something's very different here. If it wasn't the flood, then it was some kind of really wild event. It, uh, and it fits so well with the, it representing the lowest levels of the pre-flood seas that you one is tempted to say, hey, that's where the pre-flood seas began as you went up the column. Well, anyway, next week, tune in to bat sonar and uh, whale sonar. And... Um, don't forget April 20, I think it's 27, uh, that we won't be here, that we'll be down in the um, uh, Damaso the, the Amphitheater with the Advent Hope group.